It's Friday, October 27, 2023, episode 16. I'm Patrick Serezna with our weekly Market Huddle Plus 30-minute catch-up interviews with past guests. This week, we have the pleasure of welcoming James McKay to the show. We discuss his journey as an independent resource investor to gain insights into the opportunities, mistakes, and pitfalls of resource investing. Let's get James on the call. James, welcome to the show. Patrick, thanks a lot for having me. All right. So just a, uh, some backstory. I got to uh, know James when we crossed paths in Mexico, and I immediately thought that his uh, story be, would be one that would resonate with a lot of our retail investors that uh, aspire to be independent global investors seeking tax optimization. And so, uh, James, you know, thanks for joining us. Uh, I want to just start off, uh, you know, with our listeners getting a little to know about you in terms of where you grew up, where you went to school. Uh, yeah, sure. So I'm from Northern Ontario, um, Timmins specifically. I, I went to U of T with a specialty in finance and macroeconomics and uh, graduated this spring of 2008 at the height of the GFC, Great Financial Crisis. Um, and having a specialty in macroeconomics was interesting then because Ben Bernanke was rewriting all the rules that I learned from the last four years. Um, so when I when I left when I left university, there were basically no jobs in in finance, and it turned out to be a blessing in disguise. So I meant I had a little bit of money at the time, and I always remembered that term when there's blood in the streets by real estate, and the stock market had never been bloodier. So that's how I started. I, I bought my first stock in the summer of two thousand and eight. Um, we can go into that if you want. Oh, absolutely. Well, before we do, though, um, when uh, did you um, develop a passion for investing in, uh, and getting into this industry? Like, I mean, obviously you went to school for it, but uh, when did you know that this is what you wanted to do? I think kind of like winning um, and earning money from your investments is, I wouldn't say addictive, but it's that's what started it for me, for sure. I mean, my grandfather was a stockbroker. My father ended up being a stockbroker. I never really worked in the industry other than uh, for a couple of years, had some options and was kind of a pitch man on Bay Street. But um, those first few trades, buying at the bottom in 2008, and then you know, I, I eventually actually sold the top in uh, 2011, 2012 in resource stocks. It just changed my life forever. And uh, ever since then, I've had an obsession with the stock market, but less so until 2020. 2020 is when I kind of got my mojo back and started every single day being obsessing over the market. All right. Well, let's go back to that. So uh, basically, you're in the height of the financial crisis. Uh, there's chaos everywhere. You can't get a job on Bay Street. And you go in there and uh, you start investing. And obviously, uh, you hit it out of the park. You you bought the low and uh, and sold the high, it was something that we all aspire to do in this industry. Uh, but uh, what what really got you into resources? Why is it that you chose resources versus buying the dip on tech or any other other areas? Uh, well, I, I would say it's just the company that I knew best at the time was called Graystar Resources, and it turned into Eco Oro. And in the end, it was kind of a tragedy story if you look at it today. But at the time, they had $110 million in the bank, 15 million ounces of gold, and an open pitable resource in Colombia. And uh, they were trading for $50 million. So just by buying the stock, you were doubling your cash value. Um, and that's how absurd the valuations were at that pe particular period of time. And also the uh, number one shareholder, I think, was the World Bank. Um, so that was the first stock that I purchased, and it quickly 3X'd from there. And then I en ended up buying Sentara Gold in uh, Kyrgyzstan with their Kumtor mine. Again, just completely mispriced. Um, a whole bunch of other penny stocks in, in the resource sector. And it, it's, it gets into your skin when you start making, you know, 5X, 10X on, on these stocks. And... It, I, I asked myself whether it was skill or luck. I think it was more luck just in the entry price, but um, I became obsessed with the with the business at that point in time back then. Right. Well, what uh, our listeners should know is that uh, you're a, a real kind of boots on the ground investor. You've been like all over the world checking things out. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about that story in terms of uh, what inspired you to go and travel and, and move around. Well, I grew up in, in, in around Toronto, but Toronto was only... was. Toronto was home by default, not by choice, right? Once I started traveling the world, um, 
it actually started before I uh, made all my money. I was um, I was a beach volleyball player for Canada, and we had tournaments around the world. But it opened my eyes to other places to live. And then when I made all that money in, I guess, and cashed out in 2011, 2012, I paid a giant tax bill to the Canadian government. And I learned about um, non-residency life and realized that if I didn't want to live in Canada for more than six months of the year, <laughs> uh, I didn't necessarily have to pay taxes in Canada. So uh, once I realized that, I started traveling the world, kind of looking for a new home and uh, landed in Latin America. And eventually, first first stop was Russia, which ended up being a tragic story and I don't know if we you want to go into that we can yeah let's let's, let's do that let's uh, uh you know because uh, uh, I already heard the story but it's a it's a good one because you know uh it, through our investing and trading careers uh in order to create success it usually comes on the back of making a lot of mistakes and a lot of lessons learned uh through through those things that don't work and often you just hope that the things that do work outweigh all the things that go wrong and uh you know this is a a really interesting story i'd love you to share it yeah okay well my biggest this would be my biggest loss in life um and biggest lesson in life too so after i cashed out i, I didn't manage to lose money in the stock market i managed to lose money in, in private business i'd moved to moscow originally trying to do an aluminum deal there but uh that didn't work out and i quickly learned after about a year that russia was a terrible place to do business, but a great place to make money. Like the amount of, of margins that people made there was just um, absurd compared to anywhere else in the world. So I had tried to, uh, well, I bought uh, bankrupt, I bought mining machinery from uh, bankrupt companies in Portugal and Spain, thinking I would in, import them into Russia for a 40 or 50% gain above all my costs and then sell them and do that, you know, on repeat until the arbitrage was gone. Uh, but instead I saw how much money those machines could make if I put them to work and I got a little bit too greedy with it at that point. And, um, so I did put them to work and I chose the wrong business partners. And after about a year of them submitting false financial statements to me and false notaries and changing the serial numbers on the machines and transferring the ownership, uh, through 10 different companies, when I eventually found out about this. Um, I had a few investors and it was quite devastating. I had to decide like how I was going to pursue trying to get my assets back. And there's three ways to resolve any dispute. There's as gentlemen, which, you know, in Canada, it's always the best way. Um, there's through courts, which in the Western world is always the best way. And then the third option is through, um, fourth, the, the mob. <laughs> so for, uh, I had to entertain that option because so many people told me that it was um, the best the best option in my particular scenario. So I spent a few months with people you couldn't make movies about uh, in Russia. And when it came down to it, <laughs> I decided not to pursue that route. And I tried to pursue criminal proceedings, but I ended up losing basically the whole investment. I paid out most of my investors, but it was a, it was a hard lesson. When, when people um, are in a pinch, they act in self-interest um, and it doesn't matter who it is, who, how, how much you trust them. So that was, that was a tough lesson. And also contracts don't mean anything in small business. If you're like a, you know, hundred million dollar company and can hire the best lawyers, that's great. But if you're, if you're dealing in less than a million or a little bit over a million, you really got to be able to trust your partners, you know? Oh, absolutely. And, you know, so that, if that's uh, your worst investment, uh, what would you uh, argue was your best investment? I've had a lot of winners. Um, most recently, well, Peabody Energy, I, I bought at three and and uh, still hold some of it. I traded a lot of it, but that was that probably wasn't my biggest one. Most recently, probably um, Great Bear Resources. Uh, they found a, a gold mine. It's not in production yet, but I had purchased it at about four four dollars and or sorry two dollars and forty cents, and I wrote it out till it was bought out. And with the royalty shares, they did a spin out with the royalty shares. It equivalent was equivalent to about a thirty three or thirty four dollar um, buyout. So that was a big win. But back in the day, in two thousand and eight and to two thousand eleven, um, if I'm living off my past glories uh, still, and I, I arguably am, um, there was there were multiple stocks that I purchased. Uh, in, at pennies and sold at at multiple dollars. One of them was uh, Stan's Energy Corp. 
Um, it's it was a really interesting story. Also a tragedy in the end. Like the the government took back the mining license on that, but uh, the company had purchased the only past producing uh, heavy rare earth mine in the world outside of China at the time for eight hundred thousand dollars, and that was right before James Dines had had written up. Um, uh, rare earths as like the next big thing. So I caught that wave and that one was a, a life-changing investment as well. So I've had some big winners. Re most recently, I've just been exclusively um, focused on the on the energy sector the last three years. Well, that's also been lucrative. Yeah, let's let's uh, talk about some of these investment themes. Uh, you know, as a as a Canadian boy from Timmins, uh, you being in the mining industry is uh, not a shocker. Uh, but uh, I mean, you you started off like you were saying with some of these gold names, but you've uh, you've worked your way to playing uh, uranium, coal, and energy, uh, and you obviously transitioned into that uh, being an energy investor. So uh, why don't you quickly run us down uh, just so what your what your thinking is on some of these sectors like uh, I know that uh, cuppy has been on the show numerous times uh, talking in depth about uranium but do you have some uh, personal insights uh, th that you'd want to share uh, yeah sure um, looking at my portfolio right now it's uh, the, like the big themes are coal oil uranium and Bitcoin actually I'll, I'll share a quick Bitcoin story um, just before I go into the into uh, energy in in 2017, when Bitcoin reached a thousand, um, I started getting really interested in it as a like a gold bug and uh, Austrian um, economist uh, by heart or, or at heart. Um, I, I took a a course at Princeton University on blockchain and Bitcoin specifically, and I just watched Bitcoin go from a thousand dollars to twenty thousand dollars over that period of time, not having any skin in the game whatsoever, and it was the most frustrating. Uh, period of my life because I was basically obsessed with it, but made zero money doing it. So as one lesson for any l uh, listeners, if you're really interested in a theme and you think it's going to run, get your feet wet, buy some first, learn second. Uh, I did the opposite and that was a tough lesson. But I guess going back to um, energy right now, everybody had heard the uranium theme for so many years, right? I mean, from 2018 on, if you were in the investment space, you'd heard, heard the uranium theme and it was just like a matter of time. But even right now in this particular scenario where it's, you know, in the seventies, I don't think people really understand how high it could possibly go um, in a real pinch. It's, it's a, a really unique scenario. I, I, Cuppy covered it pretty much in depth, but I think it, it has the potential to actually uh, break people's expectations on the upside. It's that type of convexity. And I know, I know, Patrick, you, we've talked about this, you love convexity trades, this is uh, risk reward, pretty damn good. But coal is a more interesting one to me, just because it's currently making stupid amounts of cash flow and will as long as ESG is a thing. Now, I, we saw Siemens energy today get absolutely destroyed. I don't know. Do you see that? Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. So I was starting to think like maybe shorting um, green energy and and uh, things like Siemens was a better bet, but I had chose to play the ESG um, anti ESG trade through coal because I read a report in 2021, early 2021, saying that increased solar and wind usage would um, e eventually increase the price of coal because coal would be needed on demand. Uh, for base load power and it made perfect sense to me and also the energy return on investment thesis how uh, wind and solar were not s sufficient and were essentially made with coal in china um, all of it made perfect sense so i dip my feet in then and guys like matt water on on um on twitter and some other guys in coal twitter really helped me learn and i made a killing on that the last couple of years and i think i'm going to continue making a killing on that this decade, it's like the cigarette stocks of the 80s and early 90s. That's what coal is. Um, I've run the numbers on how much LNG can displace coal. And it's not nearly as, and, and wind as well. It's not nearly as much as what people think on the thermal side. And then the, the metallurgical side, there is no real substitute. People can talk about um, arc reactors and things like that, but it's just not, well, arc furnaces, sorry. Um, it's just not as feasible as, as, high quality met coal. So there's an there's a abnormal opportunity in that because of 
um, I don't want to say governments not believing in physics, but it's it's something along those lines. Yeah, well, they're just uh, selling a political narrative that uh, that is fashionable, and the the logistics is uh, is different than and execution is different than uh, what uh, their pipe dream is in terms of being able to achieve, right? Yeah, and it's we shouldn't be able to make as much money as in energy as we have the last you know three years. Like I, I, looking at my P and L, almost all in energy the whole time. Um, I've I've been consistently in triple digits and. Energy should be a, a commodity that's, you know, you make a, a decent return on, but not a, a crazy return on because it is abundant if if we're allowed to extract it and, and uh, distribute it around the world, which we're just governments are, are restricting that and, and have been. And hopefully they, they continue to do that for a, for a period of time. I'm not sure how much longer it'll, it'll last, but it's going to be a very po- profitable trade as, so long as um, people are doubling down on green energy as, as far as I'm concerned. Right. And uh, now in terms of uranium, uh, obviously you, you've said that you are uh, investing directly into uranium through things like the Sprott Physical. But when it comes to uh, playing some of the uranium individual stock names, uh, what's, your, what's the way you approach it? Uh, well, I saw, I saw the end of the last cycle in uranium. I didn't really participate in it. But you know, all of those names that that flew at that period of time, there were, I don't know, hundred, hundred junior names. None of them ended up producing uranium, right? There's a, there's a small handful that I think will end up producing, but the vast majority of this particular cycle of high prices, um, in my personal opinion, Kaz, Kazatomprom is going to be the, the overall winner, um, especially considering they're supplying China and China's where most of the reactors are being built. But I've I've like I've been to um, Central Asia, I've been to Kyrgyzstan, I've been to Almaty and and Russia as well. I, I've met some um, uh, nuclear physicists there, and the in situ leaching mining in Kazakhstan is um, they have they have a giant resource and they can expand. So my thesis is okay. A lot of the juniors are arguably overpriced and they're going to continue to be overpriced and they may, they may, may make a killing, but they'll end up like a lot of the um, investments that I made in 2008 to 2011, even though I made a killing on those afterwards, a lot of those stocks got decimated and I don't really want to participate in that this, this cycle once like I've already made money. Um, it's about capital preservation as much as it, as, as it is making money. If, if I didn't have the capital that I had, I probably would um, participate in some of the juniors. But I, I really think that, like the the overall funds flows are going to end up in producers. And even though some people think uh, Kazakhstan is uninvestable, if you go to Almaty, it's like a first world city, and there's a lot of money there. And uh, it trades on the London Stock Exchange. I, it's it's the only thing that I own. Oh, I own a little bit of Paladin. I own a little bit of Next Gen, but um, aside from Sprott Physical, which I think everybody, the, all of your listeners probably already own that. I think that everybody's got to take a look at uh, Kaz Adam Prom because they'll be able to pay out dividends. They are already paying out very good dividends, but they'll be able to pay out dividends possibly to the point where things like Echo Patrol and and Petrobras are now with, you know, between 15 and 20% divvies can be coming from, uh, from, uh, Kaz Adam prom. That's well, it's my thesis within the next couple of years. Um, and that's how I'm playing it. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's, uh, talk quickly about, uh, some energy. And I mean, you, be, you transitioned into this energy investor and when it comes to like things like the oil and gas, uh, side of the investing, uh, how do you approach it? Like what, what is it, what's your thesis and what type of investing do you do there? Well, it's a, it's the most, it's the most cyclical industry, right? And I'm currently very heavily uh, weighted on strictly oil, mostly, um, heavier oil. Uh, a lot of the Canadian names, like I think you've been in, involved in, in Meg Energy, um, and some of your listeners probably were as well. But that was like my top holding uh, for a while until recently. And a lot of the Canadian names are mispriced. When when the extra pipeline comes out to the export in this in the Pacific, a lot of that egress problem that Canada currently has, 
will be solved. And if if the Republicans get the let's let's just say they they get the, both the Congress and Senate um, next election, if they do, I think there there will be a pipeline uh, built from Canada to to the the Gulf. So those are that's a really big theme for me. Um, also, South America, I think, is really mispriced. Um, Ecopetrol and, and Petrobras, I own a lot of. And I've been, I was pounding the table on Petrobras from like $12 all the way down to when it touched like nine um, and buying the whole way down. And the market finally realized that Lula wasn't, you know, the most communist person in the world and they weren't going to rob everything. So, um, Oil for me as a theme, again, it shouldn't be as as uh, lucrative as it is. It should be a, a marginal marginal cost type of commodity. But so long as you have Biden administration and um, various other Western governments uh, trying to re- restrict the production of oil and gas, you're going to have a bit of a premium on it. And these companies... Um, if you if you can buy a company at you know twenty percent free cash flow, and you have a a five percent um, like Fed fund rate, it's a it's a and they're they're pretty much debt free. It's it's kind of a no brainer. People want to avoid it because they think that what if the oil price crashes? What if the oil price crashes? I just feel like the upside is far more potent than any risk to the downside, specifically in oil. And I just don't know anywhere else in the market where you can earn outsized returns on something that is so necessary for society. If you look at the EIA and IEA reports on what's going to happen with oil, they're just consistently wrong on demand, like consistently wrong on demand. And their future forecasts to me don't mean anything. Everywhere I look in the world, in the third world especially, is growing at a at a huge clip. If you go to India, that's a billion people, right? Um, China, uh, Indonesia, you go to all these what's considered, you know, not first world countries, their S curve on their energy usage is going to increase and increase and increase. You go from, you know, not having anything to having air conditioning. You go from not having a car to having a scooter to having a mini car to having an SUV. And over that period of time, the energy uh, usage increases basically exponentially. And people who don't go to these countries and just hang out in Western world or, or San Francisco don't understand that, you know, EVs aren't taking over everywhere. They're they exist and they're increasing in size in some places. But the uh, the oil thesis for me is so incredibly clear, but the market isn't pricing it as such. Um, there's no reason why some of these companies should be trading at like you know two, three, four times cash cash flow. I want to wrap up by just asking you uh, about the sectors you're not in. Obviously, uh, copper, basic materials, uh, agriculture, uh, gold. You you seem to be at least underweight these areas. Uh, is, is there uh, something that you're looking for for them to turn or uh, to turn or like rare earths? Uh, is it is there some value you see there that's coming that may have you allocate to those areas, or do you really just see that uh, um, the the energy area areas where you want to be fully allocated to. I mean, I think one of your previous guests said said this quote, there's there's no bad assets, there's just bad prices, right? Um well, if I'm going to choose one commodity versus another commodity, it needs to be a more compelling story, right? Um like I like to rotate within the themes that I like from a macro perspective. And copper I really believe in as a as a long-term theme. It's just when the turn happens, I don't really have any real insight into that. I think that we have to kind of start coming out of this potential depression that everybody's talking about for copper to really move. Um, and a new new round of money printing would be needed. And even in a new round of money printing, there might be better assets than copper in that particular scenario. But if if everybody's going to continue to double down on this green movement, the amount of copper that's necessary versus the amount of you know, tier one assets that are ready ready for production. Um, there's only a, there's only a handful in the world, so we're not going to have enough. It's just a matter of when, and I don't think it's this particular year. So if you have like a three or four year time horizon, um, copper, who knows? Copper might outperform everything um, if if the amount of investment from uh, Western the Western world in the grid infrastructure happens to support you know a build out of, of, uh, the electrical grid for EVs and things like that. But aside from that, um, I don't really have an advantage in that particular 
co commodity and I tend not to play in deals where I don't have an advantage. I might buy a, a small portion of, you know, Freeport or something like that just as a diversifier in my in my portfolio, but I, I'm I'm never going to overweight something unless I'm confident that what I'm buying, I have a more knowledge than the person who's selling on the other side. All right, perfect. Well, James, listen, uh, we wanted to keep the show tight, so I wanted to thank you so much for joining us. Listen, if uh, our listeners want to uh, chat with you or follow you, where can they find you? Well, people can find me at uh, James H. McKay on Twitter. Um, I, I'd like to think I'm part of a really great community of, of retail investors in, uh, on Twitter, and we all share information. And um, when, when somebody doesn't know something, they're reaching out to somebody who has better information. Everybody who, like me, who lives a research lifestyle in, in retail, uh, I guess some of us are kind of lonely and made, made good friends with each other on, on uh, Twitter. So always uh, happy to chat with new, new people on Twitter. Well, listen, James, thank you so much for joining us. And I look forward to uh, uh, chatting with you in the future, bud. Yeah, we're neighbors now. So you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll see you soon. All right, thanks, bud. Cheers. Well, thank you, everyone, for tuning in to the Market Huddle Plus. Next week, we'll return with our full show. See you later, everyone.